Welcome to the journey again. So we are on this journey uh, discussing about the five T's. So we have already covered three of them already. So we quickly uh, recapture. Uh, we uh, talked about uh, being transferred from that of our old nature to that of the uh, new nature because of our Lord Jesus, of what he did on the cross. Then we also discussed about uh, a transformation within ourselves as how can we transform ourselves uh, because of also what Lord Jesus did from sinful nature to that of the uh, nature that which Lord Jesus wants us to achieve in this journey. And we also last week discussed about uh, transportation in this journey. Uh, where do we go and uh, how do we go and what aspects that we need to take into consideration in, in, the, uh, in the process of being uh, transported on our journey as we are being carried by the Holy Spirit. And we also discussed what's the most crucial element of uh, our transportation. That is our Holy Spirit is number one and is the word and what should we do in order to feel or propel or to take this, make this journey uh, smoother, make the journey enjoyable and also make this journey meaningful and fruitful in our lives. That is to inculcate or to cultivate a sense of faith, a belief of faith, a substance of faith in, in this whole process. It's a matter of we believing in ourselves and believing in the Lord Jesus that we have faith on him. Now, the world says, have faith on the material things, have faith on your qualifications, on the material things that you gain number of houses that you have, number of vehicles that you have, the positions that you hold, the degrees or the MBAs that you hold, that the material things that you have faith on and have faith on human beings. But that's the worldly way of order. And look how many times have we have tried it. In as much as we have tried to do it, have faith on the material things, how much of instances, how many instances that we have got disappointed because of our very own people, our parents may disappoint us. Right? The people around us may disappoint us. And the material things will disappoint us. Have faith on them. Even if it is a vehicle, a brand new vehicle that you buy from the showroom, while you come your own way home, it might even crash. So material things are very volatile. And as King Solomon says, is is gone in the wind. is vanity because it's of no use. And things appear and things disappear. Less of the material nature. But we try our level best from morning to evening. We toil, we work hard, and we lament, and we cry, and we do everything under sun and moon in order to secure these material things, in order to bring them into our lives and to feel secured about it. So that is the material faith that we have. But our Lord Jesus calls us to have faith on something beyond that. That is the faith on the end result of the journey that we are going on. The end result is the inheritance of the kingdom of God in the end and of eternal living with our Lord Jesus. That's the faith that we need to have. So when we have our mind set on the beginning and the end from the beginning, as our Lord knows the end from the beginning, as we set our mind on the end from the beginning on this journey, we have a clear objective we have a clear destination and a clear uh, set of rules that we need to follow in order to go to that destination. We have a clear map, in other words, on this destination. I'd like you to, to uh, go through with me to uh, Luke uh, chapter 8, verse 25. When Lord Jesus uh, got onto the boat, mind you, this is now another mode of transportation, a boat, and he told his disciples, uh, let's cross over to the other side. And in the midst of uh, they are crossing over, as well, they were on the journey to the other side, uh, they were met with a tempestuous storm. And mind you, the people, those who were on the boat, are very expert and seasoned fishermen, experienced fishermen. But they also uh, lamented, they cried over by looking at the material things outside. Lord, we are perishing. Now, there's a very strong word to say, Lord, we are perishing. And these are fishermen, those who have right throughout their lives, in generations in their lives, have gone out fishing. 
and they had this waters in Galilee Sea is not nothing anything new for them. Uh, they know it as the back of their hand. But as the water started filling into their boat, and they thought that they were sinking, they cried out to say, Lord, we are perishing. And Lord Jesus, amidst all this storm, was fast asleep. Because he had this inner peace, inner conviction, inner substance of uh, belief and a strong conviction that there was nothing going, nothing was going to go wrong. But Simon and everybody else in the boat started crying out to the Lord. But what did Lord Jesus amazingly ask them? Where's your faith? Where's your faith? So as on the journey, as we take on this journey in the boat towards the destination, our boat may also face these tempestuous torrents of storms and uh, water may fill into our boat. We might think that we are sinking along with the boat. That's natural. That's in the natural world that happened and in our world also. As you and I are uh, going ahead in our journey along with the world, there's a friction with the world and the flesh. The floodwaters of the world will always come into our boat. And at that time, the Lord Jesus continuously reminds us, where is your faith? So we need to ask ourselves, where is our faith? So that's, and my brothers and sisters, when every time there's a storm raging on our lives and waters start filling into our boat and we think that we are perishing, always remember every difficulty, every temptation, every tribulation, along with that, Lord raises up a standard in our lives. In other words, the Lord raises up a standard of the boat that we travel in, that's the Holy Spirit strengthen us. And also at the same time, the standard he raises up depends on the level and the degree of faith that we have. If our faith is very little, the standards that he may raise up would be also very little because that is how much that he can work. He does not intervene in the will of the human being. He is, super, he is omnipotent, omniscient, and omnipresent. He is almighty God. He has all the right, number one, and also all the power, number two, in order to infiltrate into our minds and turn us upside down. He can do it, but he does not intervene in the will of the individuality of the human being. So the individuality of who we are in the deep consciousness, he does not intervene unless that we allow him to do it. Because that's why he, in simple terms that we can call him a very, uh, very sound gentleman. He doesn't step in on areas that he's not invited. So that's in, in other words, we have, if we have a little bit of faith, a modicum of, or even a mustard seed of faith, the Lord raises up that standard according to the degree, according to the level of faith that we develop in our lives. So the more the torrents come on our way, more the waves slash and uh, hit our boat. The more that we build faith, the more the standard is raised, the more the boat is raised so that we can face those storms. So that's the level of standard that he's going to raise. So let me take that as a foundation from last week and try to introduce you to the topic or the, uh, the, the fourth T that I'm going to discuss, that is the transmutation. So transmutation, if you look at the dictionary definition of transmutation, is that it's mutating from one state from the other. And this discussion, I'm going to predominantly talk about what happens within our lives, within our flesh, underneath our skin and bones. And it's a transformation, in other words. A transmutation is the mutation of cells, mutation of our thoughts from uh, from number of one to multiplication of many. We call it in mathematics the exponential growth or transmutation. Right? So I'll try to explain it as much as possible by excerpting the scriptures of examples of transmutation so that you and I will be able to understand it much faster and much easier. So in the, on the transmutation part, let's first uh, take an example of Mark 6, chapter 6, verse 30 where Jesus uh, fed 5,000, if you read Mark 6, chapter 30 onwards. 
Mark chapter 6 verses 30 to 44 Then the apostles gathered to Jesus and told him all things, both what they had done and what they had taught. And he said to them, Come aside by yourselves to a deserted place and rest a while. For there were many coming and going, and they did not even have time to eat. So they departed to a deserted place in the boat by themselves. But the multitude saw them departing, and many knew him, and ran there on foot from all the cities. They arrived before them, and came together to him. And Jesus, when he came out, saw a great multitude, and was moved with the compassion for them, because they were like sheep, not having a shepherd. So he began to teach them many things. When the day was now far spent, his disciples came to him and said, This is a deserted place, and already the hour is late. Send them away, that they may go into the surrounding country and villages and buy themselves bread, for they have nothing to eat. But he answered and said to them, You give them something to eat. And they said to him, Shall we go and buy two hundred denarii worth of bread? and give them something to eat. But he said to them, How many loaves do you have? Go and see. And when they found out, they said, Five and two fish. Then he commanded them to make them all sit down in groups on the green grass. So they sat down in ranks, in hundreds and in fifties. And when he had taken the five loaves and the two fish, he looked up to the heavens, blessed and broke the loaves, and gave them to his disciples to set before them, and the two fish he divided among them all. So they all ate and were filled, and they took up twelve baskets full of fragments and of the fish. Now those who had eaten the loaves were about five thousand men. Mark uh, 6, chapter 30, uh, it's a beautiful story, but the five thousand has been fed. And when Lord Jesus took the fish and the bread, he gave thanks to the Lord. He held it up, gave thanks to the Lord and gave it to his disciples and or set it before them. And they ate and uh, ate where that they collected the 12 baskets full of uh, leftover bread and fish. So, I wanted, I, the Holy Spirit prompted me and nudged me to think about it, is once he blessed the little bread that he had and the fish, he may have definitely put them into the basket because feeding 5,000 people by bare hands is not possible. It's not practical for the uh, disciples. He may have put them into the baskets. And when they had lifted the basket, they must have suddenly realized the baskets were full. In other words, there is a transmutation or else growth of the bread and the fish inside the basket that happened that enabled them to even collect 12 excessive baskets full of bread and meat. In other words, once that the Lord blessed the bread and the fish, put it in the basket and that grew inside. This multiplied, in other words, not added, multiplied. So transmutation is something like that. And we find the same, a similar story of feeding the 4,000 in Mark chapter 8, verse 6. And there are also bread and fish, where that there's a transmutation happened, and they collected seven baskets full of the fragments of the leftovers. So you may have seen, and when... Uh, uh, you you add from uh, to uh, one to one and you add two, but two plus two is four, right? And four plus four is eight. That you keep on adding, but transmutation is beyond keep on adding, right? So uh, two into the power of four. I'm just taking a little bit of a mathematic example. Transmutation is something like something into the power of XXX. In other words, the only Lord can do that. The transmutation matter, only Lord can do it. Otherwise, this world, if it continues to multiply, Lord says in his word, go and multiply, not add. 
multiply. In other words, we and everything else that the Lord has made in this world multiplies and is transmutates itself. And we can take another example. Our Lord Jesus performs his first ever miracle, that is turning water into wine in Cana. And what did he do? Mary said, do whatever he asks or whatever he tells you. And the pots of water, the, the, he asked them to fill, the servants to fill it. And they, I mean, he must have asked them to, you know, stand by or leave that place. He prayed and he said, draw something out. Now draw it out. In other words, what do you draw? You draw, you take something from inside to outside. So that's what happened when the, the water, they thought it was water from the jar, when they drew it out, that had miraculously transmutated or converted, transformed into wine. Now, water being a substance, H2O, to turn into wine with, with sugar and some other component, I do not know the scientific composition of wine, is it's not water adding into water. It's water multiplying itself of its components, hydrogen cells and oxygen cells, and plus adding something else to that. It's transmutating to a new form. So in other words, my brothers and sisters, transmutation means taking on a new form. Taking on a new form, a new facet of life, a new beginning. So that is why Paul always tells us, to renew your mind. In other words, transmutate your mind morning to evening to take on a new form every day. So not the person whom we used to be yesterday and tomorrow as we transmutate, our th thought patterns will multiply into the power of something of which our Lord can only give. That's the transmutation. So how does it apply into our healing? It's a very good sound example for us to take on our healing on transmutation. There are multiple, multiple uh, uh, exceptions or uh, texts that we can quote, verses that we can quote from the Bible, examples for transmutation. Like in Psalm 103, verse 2. Psalms 103, verses 2 and 3. Bless the Lord, O my soul and forget not all his benefits, who forgives all your iniquities, who heals all your diseases. And Psalm 103, verse 2, continuously if you read 2 and verses 2 and 3, the psalmist says, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. In other words, we are talking about an inside uh, blessing, inside. Now, our organs inside, are they alive? Yes, they are alive. Otherwise, you and I will not be able to, you won't be able to see me like this, neither I will be able to hear from you also. They are all, organs are within ourselves and they are alive. So, if anything of the Lord to take place, and Psalm 103 verse 3 says that I have healed you, the Lord who heals us, that's the continuation of it. And many quote that scripture. But if you quote that healing scripture with proper understanding of what the Lord really means, you can channel that power of that scripture in your own body for your own healing. Believe me, I have done it. 103 says, Bless my Lord and all that is within me. In other words, I am addressing all the organs inside of my body. Ask them to bless and I am telling them, Forget not, forget not what those organs are supposed to do. In Job 38, 36 says, The Lord has put wisdom in our minds. Literally, the word mind there means inward organs, inward parts of our body. So if Lord has put wisdom into our inward parts, that means the Lord has individually spoken to each and every organ saying you operate in this realm you operate like this you operate like this the same manner lord jesus also said in the ecclesia the body is needed head is lord jesus the body is needed and all the 
components of the body, the arm, the legs, uh, the back and the tummy and chest and everything, the components of the body as we brothers and sisters, we get together in the Ecclesia, we all are needed, complementing each other. But we all operate in our own wisdom according to the level that the body part is supposed to operate. In other words, that everything inside of us has its own operational guide in this journey. Everything operates in such a synchronized manner, beautiful manner, so that it should ultimately contribute towards the journey that we are taking on. So according to this verse of the inner parts of our body, bless my Lord, bless the Lord, all my soul, all that is within me, that means addressing our inner body. We can take that powerful word by saying, Lord, you have given wisdom to the inward parts of my body. And I am addressing the inward parts of my body, although I cannot see them, but through the Holy Spirit inward eye, I can see them. Right? And I am addressing liver, pancreas, kidneys, my heart, and everything that I can think of and I have a, I don't even know of, all these organs operate in the proper manner in the wisdom the Lord has granted you. So no sickness can fall under that realm and perimeter. And even if something is broken inside, Lord, you may effect a transmutation so that it may grow exponentially. My own experience, my brothers and sisters, I've been cut open three times of my liver. 70% of my liver has been taken out. And each time when the doctors saw my liver off the scans, they said they were amazed to see the liver has grown 100% from that of a normal person. I'm not exaggerating. Science, according to the thesis, the abstracts that I have read very extensively in scientific uh, uh, journals, they say that once the liver has been cut off, it only grows up to 70% or sometimes even less than that. But the medical doctors exclaiming, saying that it has even grown up to 100% from that of a normal person. It is something that which they can't admit, they don't admit, but they have seen it to their own eyes. So what happened when the doctors saw that in the images and all that in the perfect liver as similar to that of a normal person? So how does that happen? If the science has proven based on various experiments and of their experience that it only grows up to 50% and 70%, but for somebody to say, in this person, it has grown to 100% normalcy. How does it happen? It's the level of transmutation which the Lord effects in that organ. But when you proper, properly channel these powerful words into their organ, that it begins that transmutation because it's the word of the Lord. The word of the Lord, as the Lord has given wisdom to the inward parts, that word, the, the organ identifies. The word, the organ recognizes. It's just like a child recognizes the father's voice amidst all the voices in the world. A father's and a mother's voice, a child, child recognizes. As our living organs also would recognize the voice of our father. The voice of the words that they are very familiar with, as our Father made it. So if you can channel that into our bodies, amazing things could happen. This is the secret of healing. We don't need anybody to, of course, the Bible says, if any one of you is sick, let the elders come and lay their hands on you and you shall be healed. Yes, they can. I mean, that is the starting point of to develop your faith. And they will impart the scriptures and in time of, why the Bible says that is because when you are facing a certain torrent as the challenges of water spilling in your boat, you may not be in a sound mind. You may be very disturbed. And for you to exercise this, you need a little bit of a spark. That's the impartation of faith. And the elders in the, in the church, they can impart that faith, those who are of the same thought patterns. They can impart that faith into you. That is what the Bible, I, I feel that what it means. But once the faith is imparted, once the candle is lit, it's your responsibility to keep it lit and not to let it uh, go dark or not to uh, extinguish it. Carrying the candle in our lives, once it's lit, 
is our responsibility. The elders will impart it, spark the plug, and light the candle. So thereafter is our journey. So in that journey, we need to continuously build faith, talk to ourselves, and continuously convince ourselves, I have the faith that the Lord has said thus and thus manner. And I'm talking to my organs so that it shall not fail. It's a transmutation impact. So when you do, when you exercise something like that, and you will feel uh, a sudden change in the natural self. I mean, you will feel that uh, your body is responding. Things that you, the, the, the feelings that you never had, like feelings of joy, feelings of uh, comfort in your body, that the, there was once discomfort, but suddenly there's some, uh, you feel that something is different. That feeling is substantial. That feeling is manifested outwardly. The pain once you had in your body is gone all of a sudden once you pray. That's the transmutation of faith working in the bodily organ. And that's once again the material or the physical, how the body reacts to our level of faith, degree of faith, the transmutation of our faith, multiplication of our faith in the bodily organs. Then what is most important is when that happens over a period of time as you exercise it, there is a transmutation of our spiritual sense as well. We go from one end to the other. We tend to believe, we go to, the Lord reveals to us more and more uh, deeper secrets and mysteries of his, uh, uh, of his word, of his uh, plans to us. That's a spiritual transmutation which happens also. When that spiritual transmutation happens, it's more like transcending from one state to the other. Once you reach that level of a spiritual transmutation, nothing in this world should disturb you. Nothing in this world should impact you. Even if you get a pain on your body, even if you get a cough and, uh, cough and cold, even if you get a virus attack, your body is susceptible. No, because that you know in the end, when you pray on your own self and even your loved ones, that's done. Because you are on a different spiritual elevation with the Lord. This is what I meant by raising the standards. When the torrents come, Lord raises your spiritual standard, not the physical standard. That doesn't mean that you and I are going to grow two cubits high or two cubits tall. We are not going to get a physical raising of our standards. Our stature is going to remain the same. But it's the spiritual standard which the Lord raises when the transmutation in that manner happens. So in order to do that, what do we need to do? So I just theoretically mentioned this, okay, is this practical, right? So what do we need to do? That is to continuously on this journey, number one, continue to have faith in the Lord. When we see the challenges, build up our faith build up our faith and continuously say, Lord, okay, this challenge comes on my way. It doesn't matter. No matter whoever leaves me, whoever is beside me, I know that you shall never leave me, nor forsake me until the end of the world. Remember, my brothers and sisters, in this chapter, in this example, when Lord Jesus got onto the boat, he said to his disciples, let's cross over to the other side. In other words, he has already given us the destination. He is sure that we are going to cross over. Then why did the disciples doubt about, Lord, we are perishing? A word has been spoken out by the, our Lord. The word is, is definite. And it's for sure. He says, let's cross over to the other side. When he meant it, there's no way that the disciples could perish in between that. So in the same manner, when you and I are aligned perfectly with the journey that our Lord Jesus has called us to walk on, he has given us a sure destination. And when we walk on that destination, have no doubt, my brothers and sisters, that you will perish in the middle in this journey. Have no doubt. As long as you are on that journey, 
as long as that you are on the Holy Spirit, as long as you have a continuous build-up of faith daily, as long as that you uh, uh, disdain the, uh, the callings of flesh, as long as that you put aside the lust of your eyes, lust of your flesh, and continuously spiritually transmutate, spiritually grow, multiply on a daily basis with faith and of the confidence of the Holy Spirit and of the Word, reading of the Word every day and internalizing the truth in this Word. When you do that on a daily basis, you cannot die before your time. You shall not. And the Lord will not ask you, ask you home until you achieve your destination. Now, that doesn't mean that we shall live 120 years, 200 years, 900 years. It's not the number of years that not matters. It's a journey that which matters. Even if I am called by the Lord tomorrow, that means that my journey I may have reached. And the Lord will securely keep me on that journey towards the uh, with Him towards the end of everything else. So I shall end this suffering on the physical battle that I have. So it's not the number of years. Let's not look at it from a material perspective as we can see. No, it's not. The journey is very spiritual. It was physical for the Israelites. And they really did enter a land flowing with milk and honey. And it is spiritual for us. This journey is spiritual and it is real. And I gave you a little bit of a hint and on this journey what happens and even if you fall sick, what can we do? A practical way of addressing our sicknesses or uh, how to overcome certain uh, challenges, health issues and likewise. Practice this, my brothers and sisters. Quote the scriptures on your life. When the Lord has says in Jeremiah 30 verse 17 saying, I have restored your life and I will restore your life and heal you of all your sicknesses. Those are words, statues, truths that the Lord has uttered out of his mouth cannot return to him void when he says that. It's in Isaiah uh, chapter 55 verse 11 says, My words shall not come back to me void. So if he has uttered those words and we internalize it, those words cannot go back to him without fulfilling the purpose to which that we have applied those words. And if, you are, if there's any part of you is ailing in your body, speak to that part. Body part, or say imagine if it is the liver. The liver, my Lord has said, He has restored my life and healed me of all my diseases. All my diseases. The diseases that the Made, uh, the, the science has found and not even found and yet to, free, yet to be found. We don't know. He has dis he, all diseases. He has cured me of. And when the Lord has uttered that word and is released into your body part, that body part has to listen to it. There's no way. But that the, the level that it takes for you to recover depends on the faith that you build up. If your faith is on the medicine in the world, if your faith is on the doctor's report, if your faith is on the tablet that you take, that means your faith is split. If you, The more faith that you have on the word of the Lord, the faster the body will listen to it. Believe me, my brothers and sisters, when we were born, did the, I mean, were we born out of a tablet? Were we born out of any injection? No. We were born naturally as perfect human beings. It is during the course of our life that we ate certain things which are not conducive, which the, we were not wise. Let me not talk about anybody else. I was not wise. I used to use, eat all the junk in the world and not take care of the temple of the Lord. And then I fell sick. Then... I re started relying on tablets, doctors, medicine. I'm not saying that doctors and medicine are not good. But we need to be wise in the application. The wisest choice would be to rely on the report of the Lord. 
that report is found in the Bible. Your healing is in the Bible. The level of transmutation, your cell growth and multiplying in your body, your good cells and uh, your youth. Just, I mean, the Bible says our youth is renewed like that of the eagles. So when our youth, I mean, that's, that's the truth. And when you internalize it, your youth will be renewed like that of the eagles. And it was, it is said in the Bible, Lord said, when it was time for Moses to come to him, come to the Lord, his eyes were not dim and his body was in perfect order. Even to that matter, Satan grappled and fought with the angels in order to grab his body. That means his body was perfect. After all the traveling in the wilderness and all the stress that Moses took from the people of Israel, imagine the kind of stress that he must have taken. And that his father had to come and, you know, advise him. Jethro had to come and advise him. Moses, if you go on like this, you will be a madman. If you, you will crumble, you will crash. But remember the grace, the level of grace that Moses had on his life because of the Lord. So, the stress in the world, things in the world, cannot kill you. It will kill a person that who doesn't know the secret of what the Lord has mentioned. But you and I, as we have been gracefully, mercifully given this gift by the Lord, let us work on it, build on it, and build our faith in order to multiply our faith and, and allow the Lord to raise the standard against the trouble that we face in order to overcome these challenges that the world may see as challenges, but it will no longer be challenges to us. It all depends on the viewpoint, in the point of view, uh, your point of view, where that, uh, how you look at it from the level of faith that you develop. So that's what I wanted to talk about on the topic of uh, transmutation. So it's a spiritual journey. It all ends in developing our inner man inside out, as of the examples that we took. So, and it's a spiritual transmutation, ultimately, the spiritual growth or multiplication of our spiritual strength and the spiritual substance. So, in this journey, it is very vital. So it's closely connected with the level of faith that we can develop of the previous uh, discussion that we had. So it's an extension of that uh, with the topic or under the topic of transmutation. So thank you once again, and uh, hope uh, that I was able to get this message across to you. And uh, next week, we will uh, meet again on another interesting topic uh, that is called transcend so four topics we have already discussed so let's talk about transition transcension uh, or transcending to that of the ultimate expectation ultimate objective of our lord until we meet again god bless you